everyone, welcome back. This is Joni Stahl. I am really glad to be here today. And I have things I'm going to share, but you know, I'm in that mood to let the living waters flow. And God is really moving in my heart today. And he's been moving in my heart for the last, I don't know, 24 hours. And I'm going to start by praying. Before I get into anything else, I'm going to lay this message today at his feet. Father in heaven, I come before you now in the name of Jesus. And before I even get started, Lord, I just bow before you. Lord, I look at myself as nothing more than a blade of grass, than a fading flower. And I just look to you, Lord Jesus, as an earthen vessel. And I do bow before you. Because in me, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. But within me is your spirit of life. And Jesus, I come to you and I ask you to go with me. And Lord, lately you have been speaking to me in Mark 16, 20. It says the Lord went with them, working with them, confirming your word with signs following. So I ask that every word that I speak, let me hear first from your spirit. As you said, as I speak hear my father speak. That's what I speak. So I pray you cause me to hear your voice plainly and clearly. And that through me, you would reach out to every heart, to every fearful heart, to every hungry heart. I pray you will satisfy their souls. And that this message that I'll be giving, that it will not really be mine. For nothing is ours, for all things are yours. Whether things in life or things in death. And things heaven and in earth. And I consider this present time nothing worthy to be compared for the glory. That will soon be revealed in us. That you're coming. I ask that you will bless this message to your glory, that the name of Jesus Christ and your mystery be revealed more and more. I ask you, Lord God, to be with my mouth as you were with the mouth of Moses. Nothing less, nothing less and nothing more. And help me, Jesus, in my infirmities. Where I'm weak, be thou strong. I pray you hold back the impediments of my flesh and Lord, that they will forget my name, but only remember yours. So I ask that you confirm your own word and let signs follow. And I ask that you will work with me today, Jesus. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, yesterday I had a day that I was really so focused on my day. I was, I had my day planned, you know, I did my morning devotions. I did this, I did that. And it was my I time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I, it was my day. I was going to scrub the house and so I had everything going, you know, I have a system of cleaning and I had it all taken apart and I was doing all these things. And, and I got a call from my husband and he said, I lost my keys. He had just gotten off of work. He's like, I lost my keys. And I was like, Oh, John, I go, what? We only have one car. And I kind of started to murmur, not kind of, I did. I murmured. I was like, Jonathan, Oh, we only have one car. What do we do? Then he's like, you've got to help me. He said, can you please call somebody? And I said, Jonathan, there's only one person I know, and I can't guarantee that I, there would be any help from her. Not that she's not a helpful person. She's my best friend, but meaning, I don't know if they have plans. And it was a Sunday. And I can just tell my husband was so beaten down, so forlorn. Um, he was exhausted. And I said, okay, okay, let me just call. So I call my friend Molly and she has always been there for me through my life. I've known her for 30 years. Um, her family is really like a surrogate family for me because I never had a family. And um, 
I've only been close to my mother toward the end of her life right now. But other than that, I don't have any family. And so Molly and her family has always been a family to me. So, um, you know, but I don't like taking advantage of anything. And so I was like, hi, Molly, I blah, blah, blah. And I tell her everything. She's like, well, I would drive you up to where he works. She goes, but I don't want to leave my dad's side because he's having trouble breathing today. And I said, okay. So her husband, Kent, and her came over to our house and dropped the car off. And I drove straight up there and gave John the keys. And I said, okay, John, I'm going to be back at Molly's and I will be waiting for you. So I drive back to Molly's and um, I go in there and she said, Joan, will you pray for my dad? And I said, yes, because let me tell you something. I love her dad. I've always loved George so much. I love him now. And I've always just admired their family and George's marriage with his wife, Ethel. I mean, they've been long-term marriage and Ethel went home to be with the Lord. And, and so now George is living at Molly's house and he's in full-time 24 hour care and he's totally with it still, but he's in his deathbed now and he's at the end, but he's really cognizant and he loves the Lord and they're all Christians and they're the wonderful Christian family. And I love them so much. So to me, it was an honor to be called to pray. So, um, I went in the room and I had a few words with him and I was like, hi, George. And he's like, Joni, hi. And he's so frail and everything. And Molly comes in on the other side and she said, dad, Joni is here to pray with you. And he's like, oh, and um, the caretaker came in and he was a Christian. And, and I said, George, I said, I am here to pray for you. Is there anything you want me to ask the Lord for? And he said two things. One, that I will hear his voice. And two, he said that I will hear his voice speaking to me. And two, he said, I think I've hurt some people in life. And I said, I will pray for that. I said, George, I, you are still here. And he goes, oh, I just never know what day. It could be any day when I never know what day. I said, yeah, well, you're going to go soon. I said, but let's pray. And so as I began to pray, the Holy Spirit began to fill up the room. And I began to pray over him. I'm not going to get into the prayer because it was private. But I knew those two things bothered him. That it was important for him, you see, to hear the voice of Jesus Christ. And you see, let me break here. What I have known about the deathbed for the Christian, it's actually a glorious place. It's, it's not a terrifying place of those that are dying in their sin, a place of darkness and gloominess and despair and terror and bitterness and all of that distress. But the diet, the deathbed of a Christian is a, I call it the jumping off point. So George is at the jumping off point. And I'll tell you, as I began to pray for him, I can, as I, I was, I was lifting up those things to him. I could, that I could feel, you know, if you've ever been in that, you can feel the room filling up. It was filling up and it was becoming weighty. And I heard the Holy Spirit within me say, anoint him. And I said, is there any oil that I can anoint your dad with? The Lord wants me to anoint him. And she said, we only have coconut oil. There happened to be a jar of coconut oil behind me and I grabbed it like this and I held it up and I said, Jesus, this is the only oil that we have. But we ask you now that the very one who made that coconut, that made the coconuts that produced this oil, I ask you to anoint and bless and sanctify the soil to the glory of your name as a representation of of the power and keeping of your Holy Spirit. I dipped my finger in the oil and I just put it on his head and I just never, before you know it, I couldn't even speak in English anymore. The Holy Spirit took over and I began to speak in tongues. And as I was doing that, I had this image, this flash image in my mind. And I could see as I was speaking in tongues, I could see the sky above me. I could see the sky and there were these thin clouds, but they were all covering over like this. And as I was praying in tongues, 
I saw the thin strata of clouds go like this above us. And as soon as it opened up and stopped, I felt the prayer stop. And at that point, it was such a weighty presence of the Holy Spirit. No one in the room can talk. We just were in his presence. We were in the presence of the king. You see, the Lord allowed John to lose his keys. And I said to, for me to be there. And I said, you see, George. I said, you've been wanting to hear from the voice of the Lord speaking to you. And today, Jonathan lost his keys. And he brought me here to tell you that he hears you. And he looked at me and he said, I love you. And I said, I love you, George. But there was something greater going on there in the spirit. He said, I love you. And you see, my dad was never there for me. My dad hit me all the time. He's in heaven now and received the Lord, but I'm just telling you. I grew up without a dad. And all I knew was meanness and hitting and beating and screaming and name calling. And I feared him. And in that moment, God did something for me. I said, George, can I hug you? He said, yes. And he puts one arm out like that and I hugged him. But there was the spirit of love. This fatherly love was loving me. And I never felt that my whole life ever. And I didn't want to let him go. And he said, I love you. And I said, I love you. And he kissed my cheek. And it was in that moment, I felt like he was my dad. And I had never had that feeling in my whole life. And I'm like, I'm the one that's blessed in my mind. And so I left from there and I went home and I thought about it. I could feel the presence of the Lord. And I was thinking about that scripture that I'm going to teach from today, where it says in uh, 2 Timothy 4, and that is 6 through 8. And I have it memorized. And he says, Paul says this, for I'm ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And now henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge shall give unto me, but not unto me only, but unto all of them that love is appearing. And, you know, I was thinking about that deathbed. And I was thinking about today, I was thinking, I was like, Lord, I remember Jacob. And I remembered when Jacob and Esau, you know the story, read about it in, in chapters 26 and 27. I think it's uh, 25, 26 and 27 of Jacob and Esau. But the story goes where um, there was an act of deception that Jacob played and Jacob's mother said, you know, she favored Jacob and she said, your brother's going to kill you. You need to leave. And he leaves and he flees for his life because he knows his brother is a type of man that will kill him. And Jacob fled and here he is out in the middle of nowhere and he has no family. He has nowhere to go. He has no one to lean on. He's no longer said that he was a tent dweller. He was a man that dwelt in tents, meaning he was kind of hung out in the tent. He wasn't a rough man like Esau, his brother. And in Genesis 28, he's all alone. He's out in the wilderness. Okay. And he says, and it says that he went to sleep. It says, and it's 28 verse 11. Now, remember, he's all alone. It's the first night that he's alone without family, has no, uh, no idea knowing where he's going to go. There's no, no future in his life. He's got no skills, maybe a little like his brother, but he's all alone. And it says in verse 11 of 28, Genesis. 
and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took the stones of that place and he put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee. And will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob waked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? For this is none other, for this is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. That means house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to the to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. You know, Molly told me a story about her dad, George, and how he's a son of a Greek parents and how, you know, he, I'm not going to get into a story, but he joined the Navy at a young age and you know, he just, he, he lived a life of, you know, like any young man during his era, he's in his nineties now, but he did the right things in his life and God blessed him, you know, with a wife and with children. And he was a hard worker, longshoreman. And, you know, but I think about the man at the end of his life and the Lord started to speak to me about George's life, but about my life, about your life, looking back at Jacob's life. And Jacob was, had a starting out where he was all alone, but he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set on the earth and the top reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And the Lord told him, here's how your life is going to go. And he responded to it that he would be his God. But the only thing he would ask is, would you, you know, you take care of me this way. And when you read the end of Jacob's life, when he was praying over his son, Joseph and blessing them. He tells them in chapter 45, and he declares that the God that I served, who blessed me and fed me and clothed me all the day of my life, and he's blessing him. And so we see that Jacob had a very difficult life, but his end was blessed, you see. And, you know, I was thinking about the end of all things and that we see that. And then my, my mind started thinking about um the end of things. But I want to talk about this because see, George is at that place where he can now say, I am now ready. When I was talking to George and I was around George, George basically was saying, I'm ready. There's some loose ends. I'm ready. This is the takeoff point. This is the gate. And I thought to myself later on, when I was thinking about praying around George's bed, I thought of those words. I said, this is none other then the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And I thought about that ladder that reached from earth to heaven. And I thought God was showing Jacob his end. And see, this is George's end, but this is not George's end. This is his beginning. Like, like I think of C.S. Lewis's wife, when she said to C.S. Lewis on her deathbed, she said, this is not death. She said, this, is, this isn't our life. She said, our, my life is getting ready to begin. 
and I think about these words I, I wrote down um, by Samuel Rutherford to a woman, uh, to a man who lost his wife and he was so sad. And he said, she is not sent away, but only sent before like unto a star, which going out of your sight doth not die and vanish, but shineth in another hemisphere. Ye see her not, yet she doth shine in another country. You know, I have this, um, I have a poem that I wrote down that I saw that was written by a young Christian man the day before he died. And this is what he had a dream of the day before he died in a car accident. He was a full lover of Christ. And he wrote it the very morning he had a dream. And he said, I had a dream of a place where everything was at peace. There was no more pain, nor hurting or crying. A place where death forever ceased. There was no more hunger or disease, nor nations rising up against each other. All pride and jealousy were swallowed up in the final battle. The king has returned, so let us all rejoice. We all gathered there to meet. As people assembled to pay homage at his feet, even the creatures on earth and in heaven came to proclaim his eternal, his eternal sweet and precious name. There we will reign with him forevermore. As we crowned him King of Kings and Lord of Lords, I am surrounded by thousands and thousands of angelic hosts singing his praises. Oh, what a sweet sound, which will continue throughout the ages. I turned to see our loved ones who had gone before us. We rejoiced with each other as we joined the endless chorus. Our new bodies, how perfect we are designed. Oh, the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his ways. There will be joy and peace throughout the eternal days. There in that holy place forever we will be. The earth shall be full of his knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea. When I woke up from that beautiful dream, I gave thanks to Jesus Christ, my Savior, who will forever reign supreme. So read to me the word of life, page by page. God's eternal love will ever reign. And that was written by Shane Anders the night before his death in an automobile accident. And, you know, I, I, I am so, I am so happy when I think about the fact that to the Christian, Christian death is swallowed up into life. And one of my favorite verses is in chapter 12 of Hebrews. And this is going to be reality for you and me and for George. And this is a word given to us, but ye are come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn and to the God, the judge of all men, the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Can you imagine what that's going to look like? Can you imagine the entering in? Paul says, I am now ready to be offered. There's a moment. I, I was reading David Brainerd. He was a missionary to the North, Northeast Indians in the mid 1700s in American history. And when he was on his deathbed, he, you know, because he had tuberculosis and he, I mean, he was coughing up blood. He was running high fevers. He lost weight, but he brought the, uh, the Indians, the message of the gospel and everybody was getting saved. But while he was dying, there was some time that he was dying. He just didn't die instantly, but there was a moment he said, he knew, he said, I might not be saying the words perfectly, but I remember because I read the book. He said, I know my work on earth is done. I know I have finished it. 
You see, Paul knew it, for I am now. See, there's a moment. Now means there's a moment. I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. And he said, I have fought a good fight. What is that good fight? It's the good fight of faith. I have finished my course. See, there's a course we each have. And he said, I have kept the faith. See, there's a responsibility that we have all the way to the end. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me on that day, and not unto me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Let me tell you something. I just want a free range right now. You know what? Let me tell you something recently that's been really moving in me. I am done. I have washed my hands of this world and let them fight. Let them debate over doctrines and who's right. Our king is coming. And lately I've been so emboldened in my spirit to preach only the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was praying to God and I was saying, Lord, I said, my time is not yet. I want my time to come, but there's work to do. And he began to move in my spirit. And I saw Mark 16, 20. And the Lord has been really moving in my spirit in Mark 16, 20. As if it was imprinted upon my heart, upon my sleeve. And he said, and this was after the Great Commission. And this is what he said in verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And the Lord showed me, I, the reason that there is so much failure in the body, in the churches, is because I'm not going to confirm their own word. I'm going to confirm by my spirit the confirming power. Remember the Holy Spirit, he will bear witness. He will testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not going to testify to anything. He doesn't want mixture. The Lord is showing me that he's, he's raising a people right now that will preach the pure word of God without mixture. And that we're going to finish our course that way. Now, listen. I know I've been talking about death and George and his Tate, his jumping off point. And George, he's getting, he's finished his course. He's getting ready to go into the eternity of eternities. But let me just set that aside. Now I'm going to come back to it at the end. But let me tell you something that's been moving in me. Is that I have been slowly dying to things more and more. Till the only thing I'm seeing is heaven. That other world is becoming so much more, more and more and more. You know, the path of the just is like the first gleam of dawn, the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day, which is eternity. And God has set eternity in the hearts of men that they may not know what is the hereafter, but we know now. It says, for mine hath not heard uh, mine has not heard, neither hath the eye seen, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed it now by his spirit. And God is only going to confirm his word. And lately, speaking about death, and I mention this every now and then. I was thinking, you know, like my husband, he likes to watch the news. He likes to watch local news. Okay. And story after story is I keep hearing about this person dying instantly. That person's hit by a car. Three are dead on the 405 freeway. Um, over there in this country, a bus went off the cliff. All these people are in eternity. People are dying. 150,000 souls a minute around the world are going into eternity. And that scripture in Isaiah that says, for hell is enlarging, is, not half, is enlarging its mouth to receive the multitude. Because let me say something. The majority of those people that are dying are unsaved. And while we're over here all bickering about why I believe 
this and why I don't agree with that. The Lord's telling me, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm receiving commandment from him. Preach the gospel and do it in my spirit. And don't dilute it. Do it without mixture. A couple of afternoons ago, I, I was so tired, a deep sleep came over me. And usually if I take a nap during the day, it's kind of a quick thing. And I come out of it. I'm like, okay, I'm going back to what I'm doing. But I had a dream. And in my dream, somebody came and got me. And they said to me, I want to take you to this church. It was a church I had been to before in my past. And this was kind of, I hate to say it, but he was a shady kind of pastor. And... Uh, I mean, he was an okay guy, okay, because I don't want to speak evil of people, but he was shady, okay? Anyway, so I was wondering why I was being brought to this church, but like he had went away and came back again, and he has like a new church now. now I don't know anything about him. I don't know anything. I haven't looked. I don't care to look. I don't want to know, but that he had regrouped, and he had a new church. And it was a grassroots startup church, okay? Like he was starting all over again. And so in my dream, um, I went into the church. There were some people there. I was sitting in the back. I really was just like, okay. Like I was just listening to whatever he was saying. I don't even remember anything he said. And at the end, I was getting ready to leave. And the person that brought me there took me into a back room to somebody who was to the pastor. No, the pastor had left and there was another person sitting there, like one of the elders or something. And I walked in and he was sitting at this big table and there was all these chairs. It would be like a conference room. And I, I sat down and I said to him, I said, I don't really know why I'm here. And as soon as I said that, then I felt in the dream, the Holy Spirit began to move. I said, but I'm here to tell you this. I said, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for this church. And I'm going to pray for this pastor. And I'm going to pray. And I said, and I just started to pray. And you know, like when you're close, your eyes are closed and you're praying. If somebody's doing something around the room, you hear what they're doing. So you know what they're doing. And so while I was going into prayer, I, I heard the man like, call the pastor up and I heard him put it on conference. Now to me, when I'm praying, I don't care who's listening. I'm not trying to sound like anything for anybody, but I'm trying to tell you guys that in that dream, the Holy spirit now began to move. And in that dream, I began to speak, but every word was coming out with force and with a power and with like a, a strong, like structured and strong and with a double-edged sword. And I said, and I was saying something to this effect. I said, um, your church cannot grow. The Lord will not grow your church. The Lord will grow no churches. Number one, he will not grow it with your pastor. Because he, your pastor is not speaking according to the will of God. And he will, Jesus will, the Holy Spirit will never confirm. He will never confirm anything else but his own word. And every person that works under a pastor, their personal lives, if each one's life is not personally, completely dedicated to Jesus Christ and his name alone, taking orders only from him, I will not bless that body. Because they, I will not bless any of those churches whose individual government of people are not directly and soundly rooted in me. And I woke up and I could feel the Holy Spirit. I can hear him still talking in the prayer. My life began to change that way. And I started to think about people going into eternity and God began to waken something up inside of me to not care what they're arguing about over there, to not care anymore. Because you see, God wants people he can command. God wants people who can be individual. Do you understand what I'm saying? God wants people 
who have been with him and continued with him, just like his disciples continued with him during his temptations, and that he can command where he can tell you to do something. You're not going to pick up your cell phone and run it by anybody where you're not going to stumble on the stumbling stone, where you're not going to flinch. Let me put it to you this way. I, I'm going to put it this way because I love this story. I read about Alexander the Great, okay? And I was doing the study on Alexander the Great. Then I didn't even mean, mean to read this about him. And I was reading something about him and I had just so happened to start a sermon volume on reading volume on Spurgeon. And he was talking about Alexander the Great. And no, I'm sorry, you guys forgive me. I'm thinking about the Civil War. So let me talk about Alexander the Great because, and no, actually, let me finish the Alexander the Great story. Let me finish it because I know it's meant now. Alexander the Great, he did not want yes men. He wanted men that would not fall out. There were certain men that Alexander the Great chose. And I and I'm, I don't remember the entire story, but there was a process that he went through to pick his men. You want men, he chose men that he can not control really, but that he can give an order and they carry that order out without flinching, without a blink of an eye. And that now brings me to the story of Civil War horses. And this was in the Spurgeon sermon. And he was talking about officers of the Civil War. When you were an officer at the Civil in the Civil War, you were given a horse, and that horse was yours for the duration of your the time that you spent out in battle. Now that horse never knew another rider but that officer. Now that horse has never been into battle. It wasn't around all the cannons and the shooting and the screaming and the noise and the commotion. So when that officer took that horse out into the battlefield, that horse wanted to tear off and tear away. But that job, part of the job of that officer was to keep that horse going back and going back and going back and going back. And so that horse was used to one rider. It was used to the weight of the rider. It was used to the feel and the body of the rider. It was used to a certain nudge of the rider, the voice of the rider, the tug of the bridle from a certain rider until that horse knew the rider. And so it got to the point where they got those war horses that can stand, according to Spurgeon, they could get them standing right next to a cannon that blasts and that thing doesn't flinch. Are you ready to serve the Lord that way? Because let me tell you something. You see, God wants people preaching the gospel. See, Satan wants everybody to be spread out thin. That's Satan's tactic. So that you're all spread out thin arguing with each other. Or mixing this. You know, somebody wrote to me yesterday about catching the fire. She's like, Joni, what's this catching the fire? What does this mean? And I think it might be good. And I said to her, you stay away from that. That's Bethel. That's Nar. Okay. The only fire that's mentioned in the Holy Spirit is a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. I don't want to catch any other fire. I have the fire in me. And besides I follow the all-consuming fire, right? So I'm not going to be trying to find some new way to serve the Lord. But I believe God is calling people into an army that he can command. People that he can command right where they live. That will follow out his commands. You know, a girl wrote to me yesterday, and I love her. Her name is Rachel, and she is such a beautiful person, and her husband made this Genesis film, and hopefully I can get her and her husband on in September. I don't know. I'm leaving it up to them. No promises. Um, but she told me this most amazing story about her mother and her dad and all these stories, and I was so stirred up 
I was so stirred up by these stories. She was telling me about her mother and her father. And she told me this story. And she sent me the story of a woman named Irene Gleason. And she was this woman from Australia in 1992. She went into northern Uganda, into the most terrifying place you could ever go. The Lord sent her there. She sold everything she had. She sold her furniture. She sold everything. Her kids were all grown up. And God called her. And she was like, Lord, I would rather be home with enjoy my grandkids. But she knew the call. And so she went there with a little tiny old-fashioned trailer and parked it under a mango tree. And there was a camp nearby of tens of thousands of children that were orphaned because the Lord's Revolution Army that was being controlled by a leader that was into occultism. And they were kidnapping, they were killing all the parents and kidnapping children and putting them into their army. And God put her in that scariest place. But the story was so beautiful. And um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add the link to it. And her story was the most powerful story. It was a George Mueller story. And the work that that woman did and the power that God used through her life to, she said, all the children were like zombies. She, but she began to teach them and she began to love upon them and she began to walk among them and she began to kiss them and hold them and embrace them. And then more children were coming and more children after 25 years or more, there was eight buildings and there was a hospital, but she was so humble. And you can see her dancing these little dances with the children. And it's not corny. It was powerful. And then they were interviewing the grown men that she raised that were singing songs. And they said, we just wanted to follow her everywhere. And you know what? That did something to me. I want to be able to say, I am now ready to be offered. I finished for the time of my departure is at hand. I want to know that I finished my course, that I kept the faith, that I fought the good fight of faith. Don't you? I thought to myself, remember when, when Jesus said about John the Baptist, he said, you came to see him that John the Baptist, and he is a light. But there's a greater light among you. And he said, what did you expect when you came out to see John the Baptist? A king clothed in soft raiment? He said, only kings are clothed that dwell in palaces are clothed in soft raiment. He said, but there's one mightier here. He said, who's wearing, you know, you know the, the clothing he was wearing and you know, the leather girdle. And he was a rough man. He was a man of the wilderness. Let me tell you something. I don't know about you. I don't want to identify with this world. But if I'm going to be in this world, I give God all the glory and the praise and the honor. And I'm going to preach his gospel. And I've been praying to him saying, Lord, work with me. See, that's, and I said, confirm your word. See, you got to have his word in you. He's not going to confirm anybody else's word. He's going to confirm his own word. Otherwise, signs won't follow. Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of counterfeit signs out there. All these people who are following all these different like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to this conference and receive the Mary of Bethany anointing. Oh, I want to run over here to this speaker. I want to hear more about this and more about that. Let me tell you something. A lot of the speakers that are out there nowadays, a lot of them I have found just, I think to myself, I don't want to hear any more about the Nephilim. I don't want to hear any more about alien invasion. I don't want to hear any more about Illuminati. I want to talk about the government of Jesus Christ. I'm going to, I want to go to that top of that mountain. Don't you? I want to go to the top of that mountain. I don't want to be like Aaron and Nadab and Abihu that were among the seventies where God said, you can stop right there. Only Moses is coming to the top of the mountain. And you know what? I, I, I want to say this. And I know you're going to be like, Joan, you're being so rough with us. I want to say it the way I mean it. I don't care how I sound. I want to sound vehement. I want to sound like this on purpose. You know why? Because even if I wasn't talking to you guys like this, I'll be talking like this to Jonathan, my husband. I'll be talking like this to Molly and Kent, my friends. I'll be talking like this to Skip, my other best friend. 
I'll be talking like this to Mina Grebens. I'll be talking like this to my friend, Christina, uh, to Lynn Liaz, my friends. I'll be talking like this to Phoebe Danoon, you know, to uh, Yana Danoon. I'll be talking like this to my neighbors. This is not an act. You know why? Because when you're full of the Lord, you're full of power. And I said to the Lord after seeing Irene Gleason and hearing the stories uh, that were spoken to me by Rachel, I thought to myself, whom have I in heaven but thee? There is nothing on earth I desire beside thee. My, you know, my heart and my flesh faileth, but God is the strength of my life and my portion forever. And I want to read you guys something. It might be a little long, but this is the most beautiful life after death. Um, uh, what do you call it? Somebody that was there at the deathbed of a man. This was during the Civil War era, and his name is Reverend Payson. He was a powerful minister during his day. You can even read all of his articles on um, on certain. I mean, you can just look him up, Reverend E. Payson. Now. He was on his deathbed. He had finished his work. He was sick and he was dying. But he had, he was now ready to be offered and the time of his departure was at hand. He had fought a good fight. He had finished his course. He has kept the faith. And now henceforth, he's waiting to receive that crown of righteousness, which, which the Lord, the righteous judge is going to be giving unto, which will be given to him one day. I believe we'll get all our crowns on the same day. Maybe not. I don't know. But listen to what it was said by the person that was at his bed. Okay, you guys ready? <clears throat> In a letter dictated to his sister, he writes, Oh, I suppose he was writing this because that's what it says, right? And this is for you, George Gust. Okay. Were I to adopt the figurative language of Bunyan, I might date this letter from the land of Beulah of which I have been for some time such a happy inhabitant. The celestial city is in full view. See, he was transitioning and he could see it. The celestial city is in full view. Its glories beam upon me. Its breezes fan me. Its odors are wafted to me. Its sounds strike upon my ears and its spirit is breathed into my heart. Nothing separates me from the river from it but the river of death which now appears as an insignificant rill which can be crossed at a single step whenever god shall give permission the sun of righteousness has been gradually drawing nearer and nearer appearing larger and bright, brighter as he approached and now fills the whole hemisphere pouring forth a flood of glory in which i seem to float like an insect in the beams of his sun of the sun exalting yet almost trembling while i gaze on this excessive brightness and wondering why god should deign thus to shine upon a sinful worm on being asked do you feel reconciled he replied now i guess this is kind of written kind of weird but now it's saying now someone's asking do you feel reconciled like do you feel like you're ready to go oh that is too cold he's like that's too cold to put it that way i rejoice i triumph and this happiness will endure as long as God himself, for it consists in admiring him and adoring him. I find no words to express my happiness. I seem to be swimming in a river of pleasure, which is carrying me to the great fountain. It seems as if all the bottles in heaven were opened, and all its fullness and happiness have come down into my heart. God has been depriving me of one blessing after another, but as each one has removed, he has come in and filled up its place. If God had told me some time ago that he was about to make me as happy as I could be in this world, and that he should begin by crippling me and all my limbs and removing me all my unusual sources of enjoyment, I should have thought it a very strange mode of accomplishing his purposes because, see, he was very crippled and very ill. Now, when I am a cripple and not able to move, I am happier than I ever was in my life before or ever expected to be. It has been often remarked that people who have passed into the other world cannot come back to tell us what they have seen. But I am so near the eternal world that I can almost see as clearly as if I were there. 
and I see enough to satisfy me of the truth of the doctrines I have preached. I do not know that I should feel it all surer had I been really there. Watchman, what of the night? asked a gray-headed member of his church. I should think it was about noonday, replied the dying Payson. The ruling passion being strong in death, he sent a request to his pulpit that his people should repair to a sick chamber, come to a sick chamber. They did so in specified classes, a few at a time, and received his dying message. To the young men of his congregation, listen to what he said to the young men. I felt desirous that you might see that the religion I have preached can support me in death. You know that I have many ties which bind me to earth, a family to which I am strongly attached, and a people whom I have I love almost as well. But the other world acts like a much stronger magnet and draws my heart away from this. Death comes every night and stands by my bedside in the form of a ter and terrible convulsions. Every one which threatens to separate my soul from the body. These grow worse and worse till every bone is almost dislocated with pain. Yet while my body is thus tortured, my soul is perfectly, perfectly happy and peaceful. I lie here and feel these convulsions extending higher and higher, but my soul is filled with joy unspeakable. I seem to swim in a flood of glory, which God pours down upon me. Is it a delusion that can fill the soul to overflowing with joy in such circumstances? If so, it is a delusion better than any reality. No, it is no delusion. I feel it is not. I enjoy this happiness now, and now standing as I do on the ridge that separates the two worlds, feeling what intense happiness the soul is capable of sustaining and judging of your capacities by my own, and believing that those capacities will be filled to the very brim with joy or wretchedness forever. My heart yearns over you, my children, that ye may choose life and not death. I long to present every one of you with a cup of happy, happiness and see you drink it. A young man, he continued, just about to leave the world, exclaimed, The battle's fought, the battle's fought, but the victory is lost forever. But I can say, so he was saying to the young men that he was telling him that a young man had said to him, a young man that was just about ready to leave the world said, The battle's fought, the battle's fought, but the victory is lost forever. But now he's saying, Reverend Payson says, but I can say the battle is fought and the victory is won. The victory is won forever. And I am going to bathe in the ocean of purity and benevolence and happiness to all eternity. And now, my children, let me bless you, not with the blessing of a poor, feeble, dying man, but with the blessing of the infinite God. He then pronounced the apostolic benediction. A friend said to him, I presume it is no longer incredible to you that martyrs should rejoice and praise God in the flames and on the rack. No, he said, I can easily believe it. I have suffered 20 times as much as I could in being burned at the stake, while my joy in God so abounded as to render my sufferings not only tolerable, but welcome. At another time, he said, God is literally now my all in all. See him getting nearer. While he is present with me, no event can in the least diminish my happiness. And were the whole world at my feet trying to minister to my comfort, they could not add one drop to my cup. To Mrs. Payson, who observed him, your head feels hot and seems to be distended, he replied. It seems as if the soul disdained such a narrow prison and was determined to break through with an angel's energy. And I trust with no small portion of an angel's feeling until it mounts on high. It seems as if my soul had found a new pair of wings and was so eager to try them that in fluttering she would rend the fine network of the body in pieces. And in the closing scene on Sabbath, October 21st, 1827, his last agony commenced, attended with that labored breathing and rattling in the throat, which rendered articulation extremely difficult. His daughter was summoned from the Sunday school and received his dying kiss and he said, God bless you, my daughter. He smiled on a group of church members and exclaimed with holy emphasis, peace, peace, victory. He smiled on his wife and children and said in the language of dying Joseph, I am going, but God will surely be with you.
he rallied from death conf from the death conflict and said to his physician that although he had suffered the pangs of death and got almost within the gates of paradise, yet if it was God's will that he should come back and suffer still more, he was resigned. He passed through a similar scene in the afternoon and again revived. On Monday morning, his dying agonies returned in all their severity. For three hours, every breath was a groan. And on being asked of the sufferings, if the sufferings were greater than on the preceding Sunday night, he answered incomparably greater. He said the greatest temporal blessing of what she could conceive would be one breath of air. Mrs. Payson, fearing from the expression of suffering on his countenance that he was in mental distress, questioned him. He replied, faith and patience hold out. These were the last words of the dying Christian hero. He gradually sunk away till about the going down of the sun, his chastened and purified spirit all mantled with the glory of Christian triumph in life and in death ascended to share the everlasting glory of his Redeemer before the eternal throne. You see, I know I did a lot of reading for you, but I want you to remember something. This is not your home. There is another place. Jesus says, do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and re I will return and come. I will come again unto you and receive you unto, my unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And I seem to feel that God has brought me, and I think many of you who have been writing to me into a place that you are getting ready. Everybody's feeling, I'm sorry, I'm going to open this up again, um, that you're getting ready. We're getting ready to fight a battle, but it's going to be a battle that none of us could have ever imagined. And that, that battle is one that none of us have ever fought before. But I sense an assembling happening. And God is getting ready to give orders to us. Orders to those who have been faithful. Orders to people who have trusted him. Remained with him. Obeyed him. Like Reverend Payson like George Gust, like Irene Gleason, like all the people that are going into heaven today that have finished their course. And so I want to encourage you, begin to sanctify yourself. Like, jo like Joseph, uh, Joshua said, he went about the camp and he said, everybody sanctify yourselves for in three days we're passing over. And everybody, he said, gather ye your victuals. And everybody was preparing. See, there's a preparing hour. And I believe this is it. See, I believe more and more that that other world where there, no death, there is no death, no tears, nor crying, nothing. But I say this to myself. You know, we're fighters. We're servants of Jesus Christ. This is service time. This isn't our home. You know, I enjoy a good meal with friends and things like that, but I don't know about you. I feel God's doing something in me and I'm ready to do whatever he wants. Are you? Are you ready to say yes? That's all he wants to know. Are you ready to say yes? It's between you and him. All right, you guys. I hope that was a blessing to you. And I wanted to thank you guys for listening to this message. And to be reminded that God, Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's coming for people that are prepared for him to take him to a prepared place. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, you guys, that's it. Go with the Lord and keep close to your Bibles. Okay? Get to know it well and memorize as much as you can. Because otherwise, God's not going to go with you. You'll still be saved. But what kind of a life of service is that? The Lord will work with you. And he'll can only can he'll work with you by his spirit, but he'll only confirm his own word. And we want those signs following. I don't know about you. I'm ready to give everything up for Christ. And some people might say, You don't know what you're saying. I say, Yes, I do. I do. And I want to share one word Jesus gave to me yesterday. And it was personal, but I'm going to say it and then I'm going. You know, all my life, I've moved so many times in my life. I can't even remember all the times I've moved because I've led such a terror. I've, I've led a horrible life and Jesus was always providing. And yesterday when I was driving my friend's car, I was listening to beautiful music she had in there. And it was my favorite Hawaiian music. And and I was listening to it and, you know, I love tropical things and I love the ocean. I love the beach. And I've always been like that. And, and I said to the Lord in my heart, I said, Lord, I said, I could live, I can live in Kauai because my friend has a house there, you know, and she always takes these amazing pictures. And I was thinking about the pictures and I thought, Lord, I could live there if you want me to. But immediately I heard Jesus say these words in my heart. He said, all your life. He said to me personally, he said, all your life, everywhere you moved, it was because that's where you wanted to move or you were running for your life. But the next time you move won't be for yourself. It will be for myself. And that told me something's coming. So I want whatever he has. And that's, that's between him and I. But he knows I've said yes to him. All right, you guys, shalom. Go with the Lord. And I dedicate this to you, George Gust. I love you. God bless you. And thank you for everything you've done for my life and for your beautiful daughters and giving us your beautiful blessings of Patty, Linda, and Molly and all their children and Kent and everyone. Thank you. Now, God bless. I love you guys. Shalom. I'll see you on Wednesday. All right. Bye-bye.